Okay, hello everyone. Um, um, sorry, I couldn't be um, in the conference in person. We've, we've got a teaching semester on at the moment. Um, so my talks about crack growth rates and crack closure in additively manufactured stainless steels. Um, this work is a collaboration between myself and Professor Andre Kutusev from the University of Adelaide. Um, uh, some uh, the additive manufactured steel that we've got here is manufactured using a slightly different technique to some of the previous presentations in this session. So rather than using laser powder bed fusion, um, our uh, samples were fabricated using wire arc additive manufacturing. Uh, wire art additive manufacturing has some benefits in terms of scalability um, and cost effectiveness in making large parts. Um, but it's got its challenges as well, predominantly weld fusion defects um, and high residual stresses that are non uniform in the printed part. So um, this project stemmed from a defense collaboration where since there is a lot of technological readiness in printing complex metal shapes, uh, uh, there's the natural question what the fatigue resistance of these um, um, uh, samples made using this technique are. So uh, the preliminary observation from our studies was that um, there's two principal directions, one along the well deposition, one perpendicular to the well deposition. Um, the tensile properties uh, were similar in the two directions, but the fatigue life as obtained by uh, SN curves was uh, substantially different in the two directions. So another um, type of fatigue testing that's of interest in um, many applications, including aerospace, is um, the fracture mechanics-based approach, where we, rather than looking at crack nucleation times, we're looking at the growth rates of physically long cracks. So the purpose of this study was to um, see if the long crack growth rates were different in the two directions as well. And where was there significant crack closure? And if so, was the crack load different in the two directions? And finally, since um, um, the wire arc additive manufacturing process can create significant residual stresses, what are the effects compared to roughness induced and plasticity induced crack closure? So, the tool that's used in this experimental study to calculate the crack closure is the compliance based method. So, the idea is that both the load and displacement can be measured experimentally as a normal part of the fatigue crack growth rate testing. But by examining the lower nonlinear region of this load displacement curve, uh, we can get an idea of um, the load at which the crack closure occurs. In this picture on the left, um, 0.3 would correspond to the load at which crack closure occurs. And sensitivity of the closure estimation can be increased if rather than expressing it in terms of displacement, we look at the differential displacement. In other words, we fit a straight line through the top part of the curve and um, calculate the difference between that straight line and the actual displacement. And, and the idea is that we can define a so-called opening stress and an effective stress range, which corresponds to an effective stress intensity factor. This approach is 
pretty standard in fracture mechanics and it's used to explain the uh, main stress effect where the fatigue crack growth rates obtained at different stress ratios maps onto a master curve. Uh, the, the, the difference here is that rather than using theoretical or empirical models for estimating the crack closure, we're determining it directly on an experimental basis. One of the parameters that's going to be discussed is the um, opening load ratio. It's defined uh, as the ratio of the effective stress intensity factor to the applied stress intensity factor. So a value of U equals to one means no closure at all. The method uh, is standardized and that's what's been used in the study. And because of experimental noise, there is a bit of um, discretion at up the user, how they define the point at which closure occurs. So the standard doesn't recommend anything as such. You can estimate it a few different percents, but we've used the 2% compliance offset, which is quite standard for estimating the crack opening load. So to, to, to get the most data out of limited number of samples. Um, the first testing was uh, done at a constant maximum load, but variable minimum load. So the um, mean str uh, the stress ratio was stepped and the crack was grown at different values of minimum load, um, but the same value of maximum load. So this somewhat goes against um, the recommendations for fatigue crack growth rate. But we found that there was no transients associated with the load stepping in our crack growth rate measurements, and hence the results were valid. So before we get into the results, it's sort of worth looking at orienting ourselves with respect uh, to the printed wall. So a wall was printed vertically, so the horizontal direction is the deposition direction. And we expect columnar uh, grain structure along the height of this wall. Um, so there's, there's two types of specimens that were cut. So specimens where the crack path was uh, parallel to the well deposition and then specimens where the crack path was perpendicular to the well deposition. Um, upon fracture, this was observed repeatedly that um, the fracture surface looked different in the two directions. Um, notably, we had this fibrous um, surface for crack growth perpendicular to the deposition corresponding to the um, columnar grain structure. We also noticed that um, there was shorter pre-cracking pre time and life overall for crack growth perpendicular to well deposition. So first summarizing the um, results for crack growth rate versus applied stress intensity factor range. We noticed that the um, mean stress effect is less evident for crack growth perpendicular to the well deposition, but also noticed that the critical SIF which failure occurs, which is related to the fracture toughness of the material seems to be more or less the same for the two direction. And that somewhat makes sense because the yield strength and the ultimate tensile strength for the two directions were the same. So it also makes sense that the fracture toughness would also be um, similar. Now, the hypothesis was that this uh, lack of main stress effect in the perpendicular direction had something to do with the residual stresses 
distribution in the plate. Um, so there's this idea of how residual stresses affect fatigue crab growth. It's been around for over 20 years now that um, the residual stress intensity factor essentially gets superimposed on the cyclic stress intensity factor where we uh, assume uh, superposition applies to linear systems, which means we add its effect to K max and K opening, but we don't add its effect to K minimum. So as a result of that, we can write our observed um, crack opening load ratio as this function here, where UPICC corresponds to the opening load ratio that you'd expect solely from the plasticity induced crack closure. And the term in the denominator governs how much these two quantities differ. So for instance, if uh, K res is um, negative, then this number becomes um, small and U actual is greater than U pick. What that means is if we have uh, a um, negative residual uh, stress intensity factor that sort of diminishes uh, the um, crack closure effect. So here's the actual results for um, the opening load ratio that were obtained. So we see, um, I mean, if you've got specimens that don't have residual stresses and you plot opening load ratio as a function of crack to position, they don't tend to vary so much. Um, the, the, they're generally sort of more or less constant along the length of the specimen. Here we're seeing quite significant fluctuations um, within the same specimen and also comparing the two different directions, which shows that the, the effect of residual stress on crack closure is sort of position dependent on where the crack tip is within the um, sample and how the residual stress field is distributed. Um, once the um, stress intensity factor has been corrected for the crack closure effect, we can plot the um, crack growth rate as a function of delta K effective. And what we see is that the we're able to collapse the um, results at different R ratios onto a single curve. But not just that, if we what you've got in these figures is I'm showing the fit of the two directions of both directions. So this blue fit here, I'm also showing it as a dotted line here. Same thing, the red fit here, I'm showing it as a dotted red line there, which means that the results for the two directions are more or less the same within experimental uncertainty. So once we account for the crack closure effect, the, um, there's no discernible difference in the um, crack growth curves in stage two uh, of the Paris um, regime. Um, next, we looked at uh, what happened in the threshold region. So this was done on a different set of samples. We applied a K decreasing test followed by a K increasing test and observe consistency between the two sets of results. As you'd expect, the effect of crack closure diminishes at high values of delta K. Uh, diminished crack closure corresponds to high value of this opening load ratio. But at very small values of delta K, which are close to the threshold, we observe a significant crack closure um, and this would indicate roughness induced crack closure. Now, as before, the, the general trend is that the for crack growth perpendicular to the deposition, there is less closure 
um, which agrees uh, with the previous set of results. Now, comparing the um, threshold testing results or the stage one of crack growth rate results with the stage two results obtained previously, we get consistency across samples on for both uh, directions. For crack growth parallel to the well deposition, we can see a indication of threshold behavior at very small crack growth rates. So the ASTM standard would consider threshold behavior to develop at 1e minus 10 meters per cycle, and we're seeing that in this direction. Whereas for crack growth perpendicular to the well deposition, we're not seeing that yet, which means that the threshold is even lower. So the two uh, directions differ from each other um, in the um, threshold uh, region. Now, those results presented previously were plotting the crack growth rate versus the um, effective stress intensity factor, but we can also plot it against the applied stress intensity factor. Um, and here, the uh, blue data shows crack growth parallel to the well deposition, and the red data shows crack growth um, perpendicular to the well deposition. Uh, something to note that if we're looking, if we're ignoring the crack closure effect, and if we only want to talk in terms of applied loading, then at small values of delta K, um, the blue data points which correspond to crack growth parallel to the or longitudinal to the weld deposition direction have a higher rate, um, and that. The reason I'm mentioning this is because it relates to um, the um, SN testing done previously. So the um, SN tests, the life is dominated by nucleation and short cracks, which somewhat corresponds to a um, small delta K uh, regime. And here we saw that samples that were cut longitudinally had a higher life and if a sample is cut longitudinally the cracks would be growing transversely which means that higher life is obtained for transverse crack growth which is something we also see here that lower crack growth rates are observed for transverse crack growth However, this effect diminishes at higher values of delta K. In other words, for long cracks, this effect is not so strong. Also worth noticing is the um, effect of um, roughness. We looked at uh, looking at the K decreasing and K decreasing tests corresponded to a similar increase in crack closure followed by a decrease in crack closure for both types of samples. And this was also um, confirmed using surface roughness measurements. So some of the conclusions are um, number one, that the compliance-based method for estimating crack closure is global in nature, i.e. it encapsulates the effects of residual stress, plasticity, and roughness all at the same time. And these effects need to be distinguished from each other through other techniques such as um, post-failure measurement of surface roughness and um, measurement of um, residual strains on the back face strain gauge. The other thing to notice is that the residual stress effect is more pronounced or it affects the results more if the crack tip samples different parts of the specimen. So for, for instance, for the threshold behavior, when the threshold testing was done, the crack 
all of those results were obtained only for a few millimeters of crack growth. And since the residual stress field isn't expected to change much over such length scales uh, for this fabrication technique, um, the effects of residual stress on crack closure was insignificant for those um, results. And finally, um, the uh, long crack growth rates um, are similar for the two directions within experimental uncertainty once corrected for crack closure. Thank you.